So good one, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, once again, as always, every Friday we are gathering here in this partially decaying, still beautiful Apollo Cinema building. As always, I want to remind you that we are here not only to have hopefully valuable, important, and deep conversation, but also to gather some funds for the evacuation project in support of Ukraine called Helping to Leave. So please don't hesitate to leave some coins or a little bit more on the table after our lecture. We enormously appreciate it and it means a lot as you can imagine the number of requests for support and help and evacuation is not going down yet unfortunately. Um, tonight's lecture is going to be a very interesting one and it Hopefully. has already triggered quite a debate <laughs> on social media. So I hope that we're going to proceed with challenging not necessarily our speaker but challenging our approaches and our mindset and our habit to think about some concepts, I think that might be the goal. So uh, the title is Homo Sovieticus, uh, then and now, or as it was mm -hmm. Originally, uh, written still earlier, as they still out here <laughs> <Okay. laughs> <laughs> or not. So um, following the discussion, on the social media, we concluded that this term can be very questionable and seen very differently by different people of uh, different generations, probably different political backgrounds, different life experience, or academic field affiliation sometimes. So the particular term, which is widely used in the academic field, at least, might be challenged and questioned quite a lot. So some of some part of the audience thinks that it's a little bit too far on the so-called neoliberal side of uh, viewing this. Soviet heritage. Some people think that it's too broad. Some people think that it's alienating term. I think it's all very legitimate and I hope we're going to have a discussion about it after the lecture. So please stay tuned, be engaged and all the questions are very welcome. So and now I want to introduce uh, briefly our speaker, uh, who I hope gonna give some more details about mm -hmm. his academic background himself. So it's George Mchelishvili, and um, he's an associate professor of the European University in Tbilisi. And um, I'm, we are really happy to, he to have him here tonight because he has quite a broad range of academic interest, starting from Turkology and international relations to post-Soviet and Soviet studies. So I would like you to say a couple of words about your academic interest, mm -hmm. maybe, and how they help you to talk about the topics that you announced today. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for a very kind intro introduction. So welcome again. Very nice to see like international composition um, uh, of the audience. Like many of you are the students who are here for one semester or for one academic year. So really well, like, welcome to Georgia. I hope your stay here will be pleasant. Today Georgia and the entire post-Soviet state uh, for that matter is at a very interesting and tough juncture of, uh, of history. Um, so that's why uh, I was a teenager. Okay, I was in the first. I was a freshman in the university when Soviet Union disintegrated, and 
Well, the lead up to the Soviet disintegration, to the demise of the Soviet Union, as well as the few subsequent years, were exceptional, but not necessarily in the positive sense. The generally, the by and large peaceful uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union was not as peaceful in certain regions, and very unfortunately, South Caucasus and Georgia in particular uh, was, a very, um, was a very tragic exception. So that's why, since the um, the air was so politically charged, it would be like natural for me as a like responsible citizen to take interest like in the in the matter. So um, for all my um, so this academic background, which was briefly mentioned here, so I teach international relations in the uh, in, in the European University. My courses include foreign policy analysis, South Caucasus in the global politics. Um, so um, post-Soviet studies, post-Soviet transition, democratization, like Georgia-Russia relations, relations with the West, um, energy security, and actually my thesis was in political science and my thesis was about ter transformation of Turkey. So since I like, happen to speak the language, spend some time in the, in the country, uh, and this is a neighboring country, well, I still take like, like daily interest, even though I'm not engaged that much, uh, that much academically in, uh, in this particular <laughs> neck of the wood. So, um, and I am personally particularly pleased to be in that very building, this Apollo space today, which is like upper grabs. Well, it, I think it's not owned by anyone yet. Uh, it used to be the Art Nouveau cinema, one of the oldest in Tbilisi in South Caucasus, established, built and established in 1909. So it was the waning years of the Russian Empire, and it was like, like a network. So it was like, I know, it was like, like, like Costco in US or like in Sainsbury, you know, Sainsbury like in, uh, in UK, like those are like, or like Costa Coffee. So uh, the first was built in St. Petersburg, in the capital, and then in all major cities. So a city would consider a major city and a real hub. It has like Apollo cinema. It was like, you can see, it's like very like pompous, very beautiful. Uh, obviously, so uh, when, it, when we will speak about terms and how uh, how the coinage of the term is appropriate or not. Obviously, in 1922 or 23, right after the so first Sovietization of Georgia, this uh, cinema was renamed appropriately. It was Akzabr, or October, named after this like October uh, revolt. Uh, and for, in my childhood, I remember I live, by the way, I live actually like six, seven minutes uh, walking distance. Um, Almost every Monday, when I was like passing that street, like to the bus stop, like to go to school, I was paying attention to what is the new movie. So what's like being shown for a well, while for the next week. So it was. I'm talking about 80s. I'm talking about late 80s. Like uh, no internet, so no other opportunities. So uh, only three TV channels. It was still actually like Soviet Union. Two Moscow channels and one local Georgian, like Republican channel. So therefore, not much opportunity. Like to. Uh, watch whatever you like. So, no, even like like teletext, you couldn't even actually kind of just like only few people like owned like VCR. Maybe you remember the name VCR, the special like, old cassette, and only very few very rich families had the opportunity to record some like football game or like film and watch it later. So basically, kind of like cinema was the uh, the like the window to the world, to the like bigger world, and mostly cinemas like which 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 being. Uh, which were like uh, being watched here were foreign ones, American, British, uh, French. Um, and I was, I think like people actually of my generation were lucky enough to experience um, political formation, to spend their formative year in this glassness and perestroika period, when the freedom of speech finally befell everyone, when these um, Trite and hackneyed language, dry language of the like soft of Soviet nomenclature, like gave way to living language, uh, and when it was possible, like to speak your mind, it was really kind of really uh, extraordinary period in this uh, history of the country. And when I watched here some, okay, here is like a couple of movies. I think the signal will be back at some point. Okay, so. Hopefully the technical assist will help you. Okay, yeah, here it is. So uh, those of you who study uh, late Soviet Union Russian language, by the way, it's a very good opportunity to uh, practice more language, to listen more um, um, <laughs> a native Russian to late Soviet movies. So we will talk about 
like Homo Sovieticus and the type of the Soviet personality. And the way, of course, we cannot like trace all 70 years of the Soviet Union. Uh, I myself lived in the uh, waning years, and I personally remember how, again, how this stagnation period, whenever it was impossible to speak your mind, when this like language was again very trite and very uh, structured, like gave way to to the to the freedom of speech and. Uh, these movies show, I think, show par excellence what was the uh, ideological underpinning of the Soviet Union, and how these underpinnings were being demolished, how these underpinnings were disappearing, how they were evaporating. One is like drama, Forgotten Melody for the Flute, and another is Little Vera. And uh, I was 15 years old when, when Little Vera uh, was released, and I have 12, and it was just like how it called it, rated movie. So I have to, I had to bribe. Uh, so the person who was actually in charge of letting, like with three rubles, with, uh, with my friend, it was a kind of just like, like the green note of three rubles in order for him to let me in. So maybe kind of like this movie is also associated with the first, like, I would say, like, so petty deviation from the, <laughs> from the law because, well, because that film was like all the rage. They were saying it has like some actually kind of like, well, interesting like scenes and for 15 years old it was really kind of like a like big deal. And importantly, uh, so I was with my friend and by the end of the movie we realized that actually that the message is so far beyond just, okay, um, okay, kind of like the, the way youth live. Or in a kind of like free youth living, by the way, kind of like the, this film is set, which is also like Chitra, the film is set in the city of Zdanov, modern day Mariupol, the city which like basically like doesn't, doesn't exist today. So, and uh, you know, symbolically it shows, it shows how ideology dies out. And uh, new, year, new era, there, there was a dawn of new era. And at the time, obviously, uh, the big hope was that era will be much better than before. Uh, it was the time, I, I mentioned kind of the second film was um, released in 1989, it was already after the Tbilisi massacre of April 9, 1989. Those of you who studied the country, those of you who, uh, who live here for, uh, for a semester, you can, you can Google it, you can ask your Georgian host, your Georgian uh, professors, teachers uh, about this event. This is a seminal event, this event which pretty much broke the contract between the Soviet authorities um, and Georgia. So I will tell later more at length about this kind of special curious case of Georgia within the Soviet Union. So it was when peaceful demonstrators were brutally attacked, 20 of them were killed, uh, and about 400 of them were gassed. So um, that was again, that was the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union. It, it became clear that uh, whatever is happening at the center, whatever is the uh, reforms in the minds of Gorbachev and his people, uh, Georgia's future is not related like to the Soviet Union. So, uh, and again, it was again, one could feel in the air that Soviet Union was on it last year. By the way, don't mention, on that very year, uh, on that very year in Moscow, I listened, I was like also like happy and lucky, okay, being in that era, I listened for the first time the premiere of this Wind of Change song by Scorpions, which was, and again, one could feel that there is a wind of change. It was blowing, and obviously, uh, back in 1989, in, in these very walls, kind of like, like in the, uh, watching the movie, after the movie, I thought that actually in 30 years, like all this period, all this will be ancient history. So, uh, actually, with my friends on my, our ba way back, uh, back home, we discussed, like, well, how many years will it will be needed for Georgia to be on its feet, like Georgia's small country, how it is related, how, how it is tied economically with the other Soviet republics. All talks were about brighter future. And again, that was the year, again, 1989, that was the year when the article by the name The End of History and the Last Man appeared. The article by Francis Fukuyama, which later would translate into the, uh, his magnum opus, his like, major book, by the, by the same name, End of History. Um, and the belief was that all countries, you know this, the concept of the end of history, that uh, liberal democracy, market economy are superior form of governments and economic life. And over time, all countries will see its merits and uh, will follow that path. 
And um, Fukuyama was the most hopeful about Eastern Europe because they were already technologically advanced. They had normally functioning economy. Of course, it was planned economy, still actually kind of Soviet type, but they are head and shoulders above the other countries. And post-Soviet space, countries like Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, Georgia, Baltic states were considered as actually kind of like second tier. They will also follow that path and very soon become developed. So, you know, uh, the prevailing mood the prevailing mood um, was that the country is on a very right path, on a very bright path, and once Soviet Union disappears, which happened in 1991, everything will be fine. Unfortunately, that it didn't come to pass, as I mentioned, particularly in South uh, Caucasus and in Georgia, because of the separatist conflicts and because of... Um, because of another factor. So... Um, so when we talk about whether post-Soviet is a right term or not, well, many, many terms and many concepts don't stand the test of time. Well, we remember about 10 years ago we were speaking about Arab Spring. Well, almost no one mentions that a string of revolution and string of work upheavals as uh, social upheavals as uh, Spring uh, today. So again, it didn't stand the, uh, the, the test of time so far. Uh, this notion of Homo Sovietic is his own. And very unfortunately, today is also like symbolic date. Uh, today is the 70th anniversary of a person who ensured that we still talk about actually Soviet legacy and some countries still want to um, okay, turn back the, okay, the, uh, the clock of history, turn back the time and uh, so live in that common space again. So um, just like I have like small, like, like a mini quiz. What year do you think this photo was taken? So I give you like some hint, maybe if you pay attention to the oh. quality of the photo. <laughs> Late 70s. Late 70s. <laughs> 90s. 90s? Well, 91, it was the final year of the Soviet Union. Okay, and the other version? Well, maybe you, you guessed, right? Like, since I asked this question, the answer is not elementary. It's not actually like, uh, it's not an open and shut case. So it's, it's trickier. Again, pay attention to the quality of the photo. Uh, 30 years ago, they were not making Still photos. Still hmm? yeah. uh, Well, they don't. They put on when Soviet... When was defeating Canada and the US in hockey. Yeah, that was, of course, that was a head. I remember Makarov and Krutwell, well, my generation, okay. So anyway, uh, okay, so uh, other guesses about the, about the time the photo was taken? Well, okay, more precise, yes, it was already, yes, it's already 21st century, where exactly in 2000s? 2000s? Yes, in 2000s. Otherwise, other, otherwise, I wouldn't ask you. Come on, George. <laughs> yes, yes, on the jerseys, it is SSSR. Yes, SSSR is USSR. That's actually kind of abbreviation of the Soviet Union. <laughs> well, most of you were born after that period, therefore, actually, you might, you might need a <laughs> reminder. So, well, again, so I, uh, I can just already kind of very good guess. So, your name? Max, so you are from UK? No. Uh, what country are you from? From Russia. From Russia, okay. <laughs> so maybe again, kind of like you recognize, you see kind of these, these commercials, okay, on the edge of this, like the hockey field. Uh, so it's like, like a giveaway. Maybe you know more precisely when it was, when it was taken. 2000, but when in 2000? Uh, in early 2000, uh, 2010s, okay, 2020. 2001. Okay, later, later, much later. Yeah. 2017, much closer. Well, so well, we are we are itching, we are itching toward the. Putin's time. Yes, it is Putin's time. It is, uh, it is December. 2007. Yes, way after 2007. It's actually 2021. It's last year. In December, in December 2021, 10 months ago. So um, it was a. Tournament, well, uh, and again, when I was young, maybe you remember this, uh, it was a Prizes Vesti, uh, like a hockey tournament, uh, hockey tournament related to one of the major Soviet newspaper, uh, and, okay, with pretty good prize money uh, for the time, and 
they just like, well, reintroduce this tournament last year at the same time. It was usually uh, early to mid-December, December 10th to 15th. So they uh, held this tournament and Russian national team, Russian hockey team, they don't USSR jerseys. USSR actually like, like color. So um, why was it? And again, if the term Homo Sovieticus in you know, the Soviet time, if the very notion of post-Soviet, by the way, many people don't like the notion of post-Soviet. I don't like it, but I have to admit it is still relevant. So it's not about liking or disliking. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I have, have, can have a normative judgment. I, I don't like when Georgia is referred to as, as a post-Soviet country, but I see that too much has to be done in order actually like, to overcome that, yeah. not only this like, label, but overcome this spirit and overcome this like, modus operandi of the country, the way the country is governed, in order like, to move uh, past it. So that is 2021. And for some reason, um, so it wasn't enough for Putin to weaponize the history to have these stupid slogans, we will repeat it, Mojim Pavtarit, like on April, uh, on May 9th, on the victory day. So uh, now he actually kind of just, he, he literally, he literally introduced the Soviet Union. And you know, again, this guy, Putin, whose birthday is today, uh, and I very much hope it's like first, his uh, last birthday as a capacity of the president. Again, I don't wish, I really, I really don't wish actually um, this to be his last year again, because I, I, I might be inciting violence and actually can, it might be really triggering, but I really want him to spend the rest of his life, whatever it is, in The Hague after the trial. So that's actually kind of my personal wish. So as much as possible, whatever he, he wishes. So, um, and again, so uh, it means that it wasn't just enough to, okay, look in the past, because in the past there is glory. In the past there was a country which was feared. Uh, and you know, and this is, of course, it is inferiority complex. And that's why we still talk about post-Soviet legacy. We still talk about the notion of Homo Sovieticus and how it became possible when most of people loved it. They were applauding. More people actually, they were retweeting it, actually, most of actually Putin supporters in, in Russia. Maybe not, not necessarily his ardent supporters. So the majority of the population loved it. So how come that people who 30 years ago hailed the end of the Soviet Union, who didn't allow 1991 attempted coup because the hardliner communists in August 1991 wanted to have the power back. So they were not allowed to do that because of the people's resistance. Uh, again, I mentioned I was in uh, Moscow in 1989. I also was uh, there in 1990 because my, my, uh, my parents' close friends lived there and their children are, there, are they, uh, good friends of mine. Now they both live in France and have no intention obviously how to go back to Russia. So um, when I was there, I felt that Soviet Union is already dead in 1990 as a teenager. So I, I once mentioned that after Moscow, I am going to Leningrad because my relative uh, lives there. And uh, most of people has, who is saying Leningrad? Who says Leningrad? Are you like benighted like slob? Who is talking saying Leningrad now in 1990? You have to say Peter or Petersburg, even though formally it was like still Leningrad, the second largest city, because Leningrad obviously associated with Lenin, the founder of the Soviet Union, and Petersburg is historical name. So uh, related, again, related to Russian Empire, not the nicest entity in the world, but still, well, again, it was already like post-Soviet. It was like giving back this historic name. Uh, and again, in 1990, when I was uh, standing in the long queue in McDonald's, because 1990 was, January 1990 was the year when McDonald's was open in Russia. And again, people rushed there. They had to wait in line. Just imagine, just, just McDonald's, which is considered to be, this is a run-in-the-mill eatery in most of countries. For instance, like, um, well, in London, I think actually I can count on the fingers of my of one on my hand how many times actually I visit McDonald's. In six months, I live in London, and in Washington, I remember I was there twice, and both of the times actually I had to like hold my nose because McDonald's was a like stinky bad place <laughs> in, in Washington D.C. But in Russia, it was actually kind of prime restaurant with 900 people, kind of the biggest restaurant in all the Soviet Union, and you had to wait from one hour to two hours actually in a queue in order to enjoy Big Mac, a Big Mac menu. And the way, but that was the spirit of the West. That was the spirit of freedom. And it was, the, uh, it was this pretty much the proof that Soviet Union is that ideological. In 1990, I can assure you, I lived there kind of and I experienced it. In 1990, the spirit, Soviet spirit was dead in the Soviet Union. Sorry. Yes, obviously. <laughs> it must be, yeah. His grandson, probably. Okay. 
well, he was already <laughs> almost 70. <coughs> so, um, okay, and, and this is a very like, special phenomenon. How, how the current Russian leadership managed to instill in the minds and hearts of the majority of the population those Soviet spirit, which was dead in 1990. Yeah. So, um, you know, those people who were teenagers, they, who were people 15, 20, 25 years old, now they are in their, well, from 45 to 55. And these, like, like middle-aged people, these people are the pillar of Putin's actually kind of popularity and like Putin's actually policies. So he has very big approval percentage in that, in that very, uh, okay, like, like band, population band. Anyway, so again, back to the symbolism, and I'm like moving on. Um, Interestingly, so maybe kind of those of you are hockey watcher. What is the other team who is playing against Russia? The other team. Mm -hmm. uh, don't you see the blue. Blue, yes. Well, it's not Canada. Uh, it's not Canada. <laughs> it's not Canada. It's also red and white. Yeah. Georgia. <laughs> <Georgians? laughs> yeah. that, that was a very bold. <laughs> so, <clears throat> looks like most of you are like football watchers. Okay, but the, most of you are from UK, right? Most of you. So, no, Kazakhstan. Oh, yeah. They do have a decent team, but they never beat Russia. Maybe they're fearful of beating Russia because it might have political consequences given that Putin loves hockey and he takes that seriously. So this is the team uh, which regularly beats Russia. Wow. And it, it was winter. Finish. Finish. Finish, right. So it was Finland. So in, again in winter, Finland beat Russia. So just like in 1940. So again, it was another very good symbol. That maybe you're... Those of you who studied like history of Russia-Soviet Union, it was the time during the Second World War when Germany and Soviet Union actually carved up pretty much like Europe, decided who will, which country go to, uh, to which empire. So it was at the time when Soviet Union invaded Finland. Unfortunately, it took some uh, about 10 to 15 percent of the, the Finnish territory, but Finland retained kept its independence and its statehood. So again, so it means that, and I will very soon show you another proof that Soviet Union is still alive in the minds of Russian leadership. And again, it, we should be still very uh, generally worried, all post-Soviet space, because this guy loves symbolism. Again, October 7th is the day when Putin was born, but uh, 16 years ago, one of the best journalists, investigative journalists, and like fierce critic of Putin, Anna Politkovskaya, was killed on his birthday, pretty much like a birthday present, by someone who was never actually found out. So, uh, and again, so 2022, it's the centenary of the Soviet Union, of the establishment of the founding of the Soviet Union. So, I'm pretty sure that kind of this, this stupid and like the uh, fateful and criminal decision and like brutal decision of invading Ukraine in, in February was like a, in the minds of Putin, the first step to reestablish the Soviet Union, to show that the population that by the 100th anniversary, they already have it. All Poles in Russia, again, uh, in a country like contemporary Russia, kind of like Poles are not very reliable because like imagine if someone calls you from the like state run organization and asks you an opinion about the, how the state is run, it's very likely that you might like hold the truth like to yourself, but still, uh, well, however, well, the polls, they show that, well, uh, 60 to 65 percent of Russians want Soviet Union, and they consider Soviet Union, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, to be a bad phenomenon, to, and they, they want it, but that's why the leadership caters to their desires. And here is another proof. About a month ago, the defense minister of Russia, he's not in the picture, so I'm just showing the, the <coughs> YouTube screenshot. The defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, said, Literally, so there will be Soviet Union again, there will be friendship, there will be uh, friendship between the people, and when we talk about, like Sovieticus, sometimes terms matter. If you not, it doesn't only matter what the leader or what the minister says, the way the language, the language was like, well, I felt it's like I, I, I boarded a time machine and went back 30, 40 years ago. It was, it was pre glasness pre perestroika Soviet language, just like very dry, very structured, very loaded. So like a, uh, the eternal friendship of the people will be restored, we will be living together as one family, as one family of nations, of the family of friendly brotherly nations. And you know, when I hear it, I already actually kind of just have some um, qualms about it, because it usually means they are up to like some another territorial land grab. 
So that was that idea. And when we, it comes to the um, term uh, Homo Sovieticus, it was coined by a very good uh, writer, philosopher, scientist, um, Alexander Zinoviev. Uh, and again, I'm, unfortunately, I regretfully, I have not read that book, which was named exactly Homo Sovieticus. So he wrote this book in 1981, three years after he was kicked out of the Soviet Union. He was expelled from the Soviet Union for another anti-Soviet book. So uh, the Soviet book is also kind of has a nice, uh, uh, interesting plot. Again, since you study, uh, if you study literature and you study contemporary or not contemporary, like 20th century uh, Russian literature, reading Russian dissidents is a very, uh, okay, it's very fertile ground. You'll find so much about the way they criticize Soviet Union and the deficiencies, the defects they found in the system. Of course, what, these writers could be accused of being partial. They are not totally impartial because kind of they had a fair share of uh, problems from the Soviet Union and they might lay it to thick sometimes, yes, I admit. But, you know, it, but this, uh, but they, may be, they may be exaggerating, but the core and the essence of what they're saying is like absolutely correct. So, uh, so Zinoviev was the one who wrote this novel um, uh, Homo Sovieticus, but again, so I have to like still uh, read it, therefore I wouldn't actually kind of like just like, it. I, I probably, I, I'm 95% sure it is a very good book but I can vouch for it because I haven't read it, but I read this one and here something actually I advise you, I will advise you like to read because it will give you, particularly those who are studying that period, study Soviet Union, a study also because some of your linguists, kind of the, um, the evolution of the language, the evolution of the official language. Uh, so this is very useful. Um, a friend of mine who is a historian of the Soviet Union, he could listen to the radio program and he could determine within three, four years when this program was actually recorded. So because the language was changing. So he was saying it should be my early 1960s because uh, after that they already completed this railway, they never mentioned it. So therefore it should be after that. But it should be before another like, like big project because it's never mentioned in the five, year, uh, five minute actually period. So I saw that person like in American, in like Belgian American University and obviously you can understand how much, how deep a connoisseur of the, uh, of the language of, of history mm, uh, he is. So therefore, you will understand so much more, not only about like Russian like language, the, the book is written in English, so the Ilya Zemtsov, another philosopher who uh, defended his thesis about, about Marxism in 1957, but later on he uh, first immigrated to Israel and became the um, counselor, become the advisor of the prime minister on foreign, uh, foreign issues. As well, and then later to the United States, where he still lives. Uh, he is now in his 80s. Uh, he, until recently, was a like, prolific writer, and like he wrote many more interesting books. On top of this one, so I very much recommend this lexicon of like political terms. And what is good about not only he explains these terms, like put this like Russian transliteration. Uh, so he also. So he also like explains in a very caustic, in a very like good um, style, like writing style, the, the meaning of the terms and why Soviet Union was using like one, uh, one or another term. So he is a really kind of like a treasure trove of understanding what, uh, what the Soviet Union was. And you know, most importantly, what was the personality which made the, um, which was the major pillar of the Soviet state. Again, so when we talk about like Homo Sovieticus, like I, uh, yes, this term could be accused of being actually like too partial or being like narrow and relating the, to the Soviet Union. Of course, it has many commonalities with the people who were, lived in the Third Reich in the 30s or uh, fascist Italy in the 30s, in the 30s, 40s. So it's about, uh, it's about institutionalized obedience, about how make people an obedient mass. So, uh, and what are the components of that, like Homo, um, uh, homo Sovieticus? And, and in Soviet Union, apart from some common features, like in Nazi Germany or fascist Italy, or in other, um, for that matter, in other authoritarian and um, totalitarian states, there are special features. For instance, work ethics. Work ethics, which did exist in Mussolini's Italy and um, uh, Hitler's Third Reich, okay, even though it was serving very bad, uh, bad goals, 
in Soviet Union, since it was a centralized economy, inefficient economy, for 50, 60 years, the reason Soviet Union lost the Cold War was largely economical. In the Soviet Union, the growth was uh, extensive. Mostly the economic growth by, was ensured only by the increasing population. Productivity per capita was pretty much the same. Technological advance was slow. While in the United States, in major uh, Western European countries, the, the growth was intensive. Along with the population growth, there was a growth in productivity. So therefore, it created actually kind of, kind of this like the double growth, which was almost exponential and far faster than that of the Soviet Union. So basically, that was the reason. And the reason and the underlying reason for such a difference in growth was the market economy as opposed to the planned economy. So planned economy ensured inefficiencies. That's why people were paid little. Prices also were artificially low. And basically, the work ethics of the Soviet Union consisted of one phrase. So all people who still live by that rule, and unfortunately, they are people, in all post-Soviet countries, maybe kind of the percentages differ. I would wager that in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, the fraction of these people is significantly lower than in Georgia, and in Georgia is still lower than, say, in some Central Asian countries. But the people who have the following work ethics, that uh, we pretend the work, the country pretends to pay us. So that was like basically kind of the, the easy formula. Since like salaries were low, not much was, uh, uh, could be afforded, and again, it, was, uh, it is very difficult, of course, to calculate a GDP or GDP per capita in a, such a close society as the Soviet Union, but, you know, uh, intelligence, Western intelligence was managing like, to, do, to gauge approximately within a few percentage like, points by the consumption and by the like, uh, living style and by the um, uh, incidence of different cars uh, and international travels. So what was the Soviet Union like? And again, one important thing for like those who study like this period, Soviet Union was not monolithic. So uh, obviously Stalin's period cannot be likened to the period of Khrushchev's so-called thaw, when it became a little bit longer. So basically kind of, kind of like if you, take, if you imagine like metaphorically, the dog's chain was lengthened actually kind of like two or three times, but still it was a chain. But still it was a dog and still it was like Soviet system. Even though, of course, actually, and well, it could bark longer, a little bit longer than during like, Stalin's time. So it was a different in uh, essence, if a different, uh, in kind. It was different only in extent. So Brezhnev stagnation period like, uh, so brought, uh, brought about another features, but that was, that was the most underlying thing, so that uh, work ethics was extremely low. And because of this like, work ethics, creative bribery so it was, uh, was ubiquitous. I wouldn't say like necessarily bribery, but you know, it's like way to, way to exist. So people had to invent other ways. Uh, sometimes it was like, um, so people worked as a, like, like, like taxi driver. Sometimes they grew something and sold something. Uh, sometimes they were like tutoring. Again, I remember my parents actually come to Spain. They, were, they, had, they had a daytime uh, working actors in the theater and then so my mother taught Russian language literature, my father taught history, so for additional income. So that was a very, I would say, uh, traditional way of like, supporting family. But again, so that was, that was in illegal, Soviet, right? what? That was illegal. And that was illegal, most importantly, that was illegal. Uh, that was, again, when we talk about like Soviet Soviets, like we will see that the language of the authorities and the language of the people was different. So that was called, you could, again, the, the very interesting phrase, <laughs> so uh, uh, labor unrelated income. So as if doing something like for money like was, uh, uh, was illegal. But again, everything should be like, like, like uh, through the state. That's why uh, until 70s, okay, I already kind of, uh, I remember only once or twice, we were asked to the school to the so-called subotnik. So what is Saturday? So uh, the, after five uh, day working week, so many people uh, being in the factory, being in these like uh, institutions or being in other agencies, they were asked once a month, sometimes twice a month, to come and work on Saturday pro bono and for the well-being of the society, for the building of the country. But most importantly, it was again stealing some private time, so ensuring that people have less time for themselves and more time among, under the control, because of course subotnik was usually organized, people were like either planting trees or planting potatoes or like uh, collecting garbage, usually there was a, like some mass activity under supervision. So again, uh, that homo sovieticus is the type which 
uh, of the person who has very low so-called like social capital. They can operate, they can function only under, super under supervision from some authorities. They need authorities. And since they need authorities, they are very passive. So um, their political participation and other participation is extremely low. They think, they only think, okay, I choose the government, I choose the leadership, they do things for me. So kind of they deny themselves the agency, the human agency, the citizenship agency. So that is an important part. So whenever we see uh, this happen, and we see unfortunately in modern day Russia kind of okay, the reversal, the, the re okay, massive reversal back to this like this Soviet mentality uh, when authoritarian autocratic leader has the like um, 50, 60, 70, 8 percent support depending on how aggressive his foreign policy is and the more aggressive foreign policy the bigger is support. So therefore it just shows that uh, they consider themselves not a kind of like person, personality, but a part of the bigger cause. Again, they need a bigger cause. They consider themselves like a, just like, okay, like yeah, soldiers or like, like private soldiers, only the, uh, the passive recipients of the, uh, of the will and obedient recipients. So that is uh, another aspect of this, of the concept. Oh, let me move a little bit further. So, um, again, um, so because for the lack of time, I won't show you the, uh, the progress of the Soviet uh, citizenship. But you know, many of you who watch this movie, and I advise all international students who come to any post-Soviet space, who come here to study Russia, Russian literature, and Russian history. Again, Russian art, well, cinema and literature, of course, kind of the major pillars of the art, and in my opinion, one of the best books, The Heart of a Dog, written by Mikhail Bulgakov in 1922. Again, about this uh, so-called Chilavek Novova Tipa, about this uh, new type of a person. What was the idea? Uh, what was the ideal that the Soviet authorities actually kind of pictured as a um, as an image of the like good reliable builder of the communism. So, this one is uh, in authority. So he he has like several people under his supervision. One is like Schwander and another is Sharikov. Okay, just again, I will not like tell you more. Just watch this film, and it is on YouTube, available on YouTube with English subtitles. So in Russia, so by the it will be very useful for the uh, for the learners. But obviously, Soviet Union couldn't survive on only that type of people, only a bit obedient mass passive brainless soldiers they needed to compete particularly in the cold war and that was a big i would say predicament that was a big fix that was a big challenge that soviet union couldn't overcome that was actually kind of well double whammy you can call it so they needed people like those okay brainless passive obedient believing everything the authority stay but on the other hand, they need scientists, engineers, they need technology, they wanted to compete with the United States in the Cold War, and they were competing for about, uh, well, 45 years, till um, early 90s, pretty much till the end of the Soviet Union, when technological advantage of the United States became too conspicuous. Uh, the Soviets launched the first satellite, Sputnik, and it caused quite a stir in the United States. Uh, so I studied education. Uh, kind of as a, um, uh, in a master's program in the United States and we were given the book, well, to analyze the book, which was uh, written in 1958 and the name of the book was What Ivan Knows That Johnny Doesn't. So about like why Soviet Union is ahead of the United States, why Soviets actually kind of are ahead. So what is there? And of course that the, the answer was that actually the education system and you know it cost uh, the reintroduction of a very rigorous science and math curriculum in the United States like in, uh, in early 60s. But again, so therefore they needed people who would be like brainy enough. And they, that was actually kind of, kind of this deal, that was the um, perception, that was the vision that if we send more people to like math, science, engineering, well, of course, we will create kind of this like this uh, cohort of people who will do technology, who will help us compete. Uh, with the United States. On the other hand, they will only know science and math and they will not know social sciences. They will never challenge the rightfulness of our cause. And that they were super wrong in that. It was, it was 
Uh, Soviet scientist, scholar, Andrei Sakharov. So I think one of the greatest people in the 20th, in, in the 20th century, the physicist. Okay, not without deficiencies, not ideal, obviously. Particularly some, some of his views on Georgia could be questioned, obviously. Again, again, again. So, well, it could be the, said the same about Gorbachev, whom I still regard a historic person. Well, historic, not necessarily kind of like positive and wonderful. So, uh, but in case of Sagar, he was the one who started to challenge, to question the ideological underpinnings, the ideological I would say, edif Soviet edifice. So he was exiled. He, uh, he won the Nobel Peace Prize in, this, in the 70s for his, uh, for his activity. So the idea that this notion that like, if, you, if we send too much people in science, math, technology, so they will be socially passive because they wouldn't know social science, but you know, citizens with brains, okay, so this is a weapon. And this is a weapon that Soviet authorities couldn't overcome. Therefore, they had an increasingly conscious population who wouldn't buy this ideological rubbish, who wouldn't buy that like stupid language which, which you will read actually in Lyazemtsov's book. So that's why uh, this homo was disappearing. And this is precisely the reason that when Glass and Perestroika set in, when uh, literature which was prohibited mm, during Soviet Union reappeared, well, the Republic and people started reading it with the same Bulgakov and some other writers. So people turned out to be prepared. People turned out to be willing to do away with the Soviet Union and okay, build a new country. So that's why, for me personally, it was a big shock when uh, Putin came to power in 2000. So how gradually he brought that society back to square one, back to square 1950, 1960. So today, unfortunately, the mental picture of many Russians, again, so I know there are some Russian citizens here, uh, well, don't mean anything, uh, no offense, and obviously, you know, kind of you're like, very conscious people, and uh, you, are, you are actually the new hope of Russia. So you are the people actually who, uh, who is the proof that Russia can be much better. And at some point, I believe it's a very, not very distant future, will be a much better country. So, but today, the significant part of the Russian society thinks the same way about state, about actually their role as they did in the 50s, in, in deep contrast with the, with the 90s. So, uh, since we are in Georgia, I also devote a few minutes to this uh, Georgian situation, so which I call the, the curious case of Georgia. So what is curious about Georgia? Why, okay, kind of Soviet Georgia was, of course, Soviet, uh, okay, integral part of this big country, um, so contributor to, to, to certain like aspects, but, um, okay, one, one distinction which uh, singles out Georgia compared to, for instance, Armenia and Azerbaijan. So Georgia, unlike many other countries, did experience very brief history of independence by the time it was forcibly incorporated in the Soviet Union. There was a German, sorry, Georgian Demo Democratic Republic of Georgia, which existed for three years, and then from the end of the uh, First World War till the forcible incorporation into the Soviet Russia. And that country, unlike its neighbors and some other countries, which quasi countries which existed for a couple of years, it was a really viable state. Uh, in Armenia, for two years, it was actually almost permanent famine. So kind of this like, well, it was an independent state, but it was all, always being attacked by uh, Ottoman, by, the Tur by Turkey. So that's why for Armenians, for instance, like the incorporation of the Soviet Union, of course it was a loss of independence, but at the same time it was the gaining of the measure of stability. So it was a trade-off, which most of the population accepted. Similarly in Azerbaijan, in Azerba Azerbaijan had a very refined, very sophisticated, very educated leadership. It was a very thin layer of the population. 95 to 96 percent of the population, German population, was illiterate. So that's why when these people were driven out by the Soviet authorities, they were left with pretty much tabula rasa, population which could not read and write. Of course, kind of like when Soviet Union reintroduced the mass education program, they became very obedient citizens. That's why in Azerbaijan they, there was no resistance. And in Georgia it was actually a very different mixture. Georgia, in Georgia population was literate, was generally educated. The country was institutionally strong and it tackled successfully all the challenges except of course 
okay, vastly superior force of the Soviet authorities, of the Soviet army which invaded Georgia in 1921. That's why in Georgia, for Georgians, unlike Armenians and Azerbaijanis, the loss of independence was just a loss of independence without any but, without any other sites. There was no trade-off. It was, their independence was killed, their independence was wrested away from them. That's why in Georgia the resentment was always stronger than in other republics. And this was the reason the Soviet authorities decided. So, uh, well, we will create more benefits for them. So Georgian case was, uh, was, was different because it, it was bearing higher costs from the Soviet authorities to keep the country, country loyal. So it turns out that in the 60s, 70s and 80s, Georgia was receiving roughly three times as much money that it actually like produced. So Georgia was living three times better than it actually deserved because of that actually kind of like the desire of the Soviet authorities to keep them loyal. You know, then, no, that was a policy. So they realized in order to keep Georgians loyal, in order like, to prevent them from That's asking fine. for independence, let them live well, let them be satisfied. So let actually kind of like, like put more resources there. Yes, like other republics, so they had to live on their resources, on what they produced. So some countries were kind of like the, uh, had donations. For instance, Central Asian states. Uh, they were receiving more than they were producing because some, some industries had to be sustained uh, because the over the productivity level was, uh, was low. But for instance, like countries like Ukraine, Belarus, or, or the Baltic states, they were contributing more to the like, just the, the common coffers than they were like, producing. Them. They were actually givers, and Georgia was a major, well, it was a, not major because of the small size, but in a per capita, but on a per capita basis, a major taker. And again, so Georgia had a number of advantages. So uh, I also advise you, also, I didn't have like, to uh, write about, um, to, the, to mention the author, Tom Deval, Thomas Deval, one of the best scholars on uh, post-Soviet affairs. He wrote a wonderful book by the name Black Garden on Nagorno-Karabakh conflict on the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And he also wrote a couple of books on, about the Caucasus. And he devoted actually sub-chapter when he, he speaks about like Soviet Caucasus, about Soviet Florida. So how the subtropical littoral of Georgia was turned into the touristic Mecca. How uh, Georgia, with a population of about 5 million in the late 80s, was receiving 7 to 8 million people as tourists. Of course, mostly from uh, uh, other Soviet republics. And again, it was mostly on the, on the Black Sea coast during the, during the summer vacation. Again, when Soviet authorities wanted to like, put their best foot forward and showcase their country, well, other than Moscow, they were sent to either St. Petersburg because, because of kind of the architectural riches and because it's like the city is called kind of the Northern Venice and because of like, well, uh, very wonderful monuments in the city and, uh, and around or in Georgia. So Georgia was an alternative destination. So, well, other than Moscow, they were usually kind of they were sending people, particularly people from so-called capitalist countries, the countries which were not actually kind of the part of the Warsaw Pact and that was the reason uh, why in Georgia, unlike Armenia, Azerbaijan, so I personally in the 80s, I saw people, a group of people from UK or a group of people like from the United States or like, and that was when I was telling that to my friend from Armenia, Azerbaijan, they were in disbelief, they wouldn't believe me, even in Ukraine. So kind of, come on, you saw, okay, and I was 10, 11 years old. So you saw a French, Boy. a living French, you saw a Brit, you saw an American, so not only I saw, I only tried to, like, to, to speak several words and kind of like they gave me like, a couple of bubble gums, which was uh, pretty much a currency in the Soviet Union at the time. <laughs> so, uh, and, and therefore, we, kind of, we had, okay, of course it was like, again, so uh, I was lucky because kind of our, our school, our school, our class was on excursion and, uh, and ethnographic museum and okay, this uh, group of tourists happened to be there as well. So of course I was actually luckier than some of uh, the peers, but still, it was possible. So Georgia was a showcase wow. in many regards. And since it was a showcase, the showcase should be bright, the showcase should be clean, it should be actually kind of just wow. like well run. Why, why did it attract Georgia? Well, subtropical climate, tropical. Uh, yes. Geographical? Geography, of course, culture. geography, culture, food, dancing, singing, you know, actually all this like cultural attraction. So Georgia was a nice country to showcase. And since it is a showcase, Soviet authorities did not spare resources actually to keep this like, like showcase in good shape. So that was actually one of the... Uh, one of the 
Uh, some Georgians believe, what do you know? But that was the case in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s. Well, I am talking about my anecdotal story of 1983 or 1984, when I was nine or ten years old. It's what, it was at, at that period. So, um, again, it is still a question. Again, I'm not delving into this, whether Georgia benefited from the fact that Stalin was Georgian. In certain aspects, it may, be, may have benefited, but in terms of human capital, and I believe that like, human capital at the end of the day is more important than like, uh, okay, tourists or like, some other like, like banking sector or some other, I would say, immediate pecuniary and like, monetary benefits. So the human capital was devastated in Georgia because almost everyone who was able to think, to critically assess like Soviet authorities, all, almost all of those who were not homo Sovieticus, and again, I told you, right, so in Georgia had a viable state, educated population by 1921, so Georgia was more dangerous ideologically, that was actually kind of the way Soviet Union had this carrot and stick approach, on the other hand, they were, okay, uh, investing more, they were giving out more money and more resources to Georgia for them like, to live, on the other hand, they were really hunting those who dare to disagree. How many Georgian writers, poets, painters, um, people of theater were suffered, not suffered, but were killed, yeah. were executed or sent to gulags during like Stalin and Stalin's repression. So Georgia, well, I wouldn't say that Georgia was a net winner. Well, one thing is actually how much the country actually donates and another is what it does to the people, particularly kind of the critical people. That was this artificial creation. When we, when we, th when we read about terrible Stalin's purges, uh, that was the reason. The reason was to kill off this part of the society which was relatively critical, which knew more, which, uh, which could question the rightfulness of the, uh, of the decisions of the leadership, and thus artificially create kind of obedient population. I have a question. Yes. With your permission. Obviously, uh, obviously. We speak about homo Sovieticus, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, there, been, uh, there were 15 republics in the Soviet Union. So I didn't have time to go all 15 here. Yeah. Okay. So, who were the greatest homo Sovieticus out of these republics? The, the greatest? <laughs> your, your uh, uh, my opinion <laughs> is that probably, and again, no offense, man, and again, uh, this is a charge question. It's not very like the right <laughs> question. It's like, well, <laughs> so it's like, uh, chapter is like, well, the question <laughs> of it's like, uh, so designed, d designed to actually put me in a difficult, oh, but, but you know, I accept all okay. Nice. I, I, uh, probably, okay, let me, let me ask like diplomatic, diplomatically, people outside Baltic states, Georgia, and that's basically it, <laughs> in all other 11 republics. So, they shared actually kind of this, the leadership. Well, now well, what was Uzbekistan more Sovietized than or Kazakhstan Armenia. or Armenians more than Azerbaijan? That is different, you know, it, it's about different aspects. For instance, Armenians were taking their nationality, their history very seriously. That's why Armenians were allowed to write, to write, Soviet to write in their... Mode. Who loved, who admitted Soviet mentality mode? Georgians, you know, it's somewhat about mentality. Well, in, in Georgia, again, maybe, maybe Georgians didn't admit mentality. Oh, unfortunately, that was... Um, Just asking for more. Thank you. Otherwise, mm -hmm. our yeah, people Mike. on YouTube wouldn't be able to hear you. Nice. Amazing. Unfortunately. <coughs> <laughs> okay. So... So, so we talk about actually which was more Soviet, which was less Soviet. Uh, so I would wager, I would wager that, um, unfortunately I forgot to upload that slide. Again, uh, Google the name, uh, Merab Mabardashvili, a Georgian philosopher and I think actually one of the brightest minds of Georgia like in the Soviet times and he's, uh, he was writing like uh, profusely about Georgia in the Soviet Union. So uh, about the benefits and about the deficiencies and mostly about how in Georgia, Soviet authorities, Soviet rule instills into the minds of people kind of this like bad, parasitic, idle spirit. So the problem for Mamadou is not that the Soviet Union occupied Georgia physically, 
okay, but it occupied it mentally. That the Georgians, not being communist and not being actually kind of like the believers of the cause, they served the cause because they benefited from it. They had the immediate benefit. And this immediate benefit was mostly like monetary and, well, the Georgia lived, as I told you, better than this on average than the Soviet Union because of that. And for Mamardashvili and for people with critical thinking, that was more of a problem than a benefit. Unfortunately today, so talk about that like to, to, to people, to Georgian people, and then you can gauge actually kind of his, like, uh, I would say, the percentage of, of, of Soviet, Soviet leftover in his mind, in, in, in his psyche, in his, uh, in his personality. Tell him about, you know, what about in Soviet time when, Soviet, when, when Georgia lived good because Soviet authorities they were donating more, they were living to give you more, you know, they made that live well. Why, don't we, why do we resent it? Why don't we like it? Wasn't it good? The living standards, and one of the reasons why many people today kind of have the Soviet nostalgia, because living standards, and it's all our fault, living standards in late Soviet Georgia in late 80s was considerably higher than today in Georgia. And this is not the case in the Baltic states. In the Baltic states, they reached the level of the late Soviet Union. They had, the, they had painful reforms. They had to undergo painful reforms, market reforms, which was, was not easy. It was a efficient shock therapy in five, six years, they reached the level of 1990, um, the level final year of the Soviet Union, and then they are, their economy is uh, on average 2.5 two time, times, 2.5 times bigger than the economy of late Soviet Union. Today, the Balts, Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians live considerably better. So for them, Soviet Union is ancient history, not very pleasant history, history of occupation, history of a uh, very modest living standard. Yes, they were not starving. In Soviet Union, almost no one lived from hands to mouth. It was actually kind of massive, also like social uh, programs, actually to keep people from abject poverty. But again, that was not bright. That was just enough, like, well, to survive. Well, yes, they were not hungry, uh, but they couldn't afford much. Now they can afford significantly more. That's why there will be no Soviet nostalgia in those states. In all other republics, Many, maybe kind of Azerbaijan because of the oil money, oil resources, and Turkmenistan because of the natural gas. But, well, you can actually kind of watch YouTube uh, on Turkmenistan. And you can see that that type of mentality, it's, it's like, it's almost a caricature. It's like, you wouldn't believe this is a real story. You will see it is a film. You will be, it is like the, uh, you know, this, it's filmed by Sasha Baron Cohen about like, like some fictional, terrible, I would say, kind of dystopian country. So you will think when you, when you watch modern day like Turkmenistan, when this, this adulation of the leader and, well, people, basically people turned into sheep, sorry. <laughs> no offense, man, like to the Turkmenistan, but basically you will see kind of this like sheep-like obedience, sheepish obedience. Uh, and again, that became possible because of not only Soviet Union, because Baltic states were also Soviet Union, but okay, what was the country before? Again, I talked about like in Georgia, Georgia had the period of independence. Yes, it was part of the Russian Empire, but Georgia had this history of statehood and institu institutionalized existence. That was not the case in Turkmenistan. Central Asia was mostly actually kind of semi-state without actually kind of defined borders. Uh, well, that was pretty much like nothing. It was like the tabula rasa. It's like, well, semi, very loosely related actually like tribes. There was no no statehood there. And Soviet Union brought for them statehood. For them, Soviet Union was a huge leap forward institutionally because there was no state, there was no structure, no institutions, and all of a sudden they get it. Yes, oppressive, yes, not nice, planned economy, inefficient, but still something that wasn't present before. That's why for these countries, they still kind of, you'll find a much bigger Soviet nostalgia in uh, maybe like Uzbekistan, maybe Kazakhstan, some other countries. In Turkmenistan, uh, you won't find it because actually like now they are, they praise only their leaders. Now they are actually kind of immortal leader. So otherwise, otherwise, of course, actually in these republics you can find it. I want final anecdotal, like factual uh, information and then I will be open to, um, uh, for the questions. Again, it is believed that Georgia is a European country. You obviously heard, I, I wager that every uh, student who is today in Georgia, you heard at least once the phrase, we know how, how, how we Georgians uh, think about Europe. I'm Georgian, therefore I'm European. That's the words of our prime minister. Probably everyone, like, to, well, many people tell you this, as a proof that we are internally, intrinsically, kind of just like to the core Europeans, as if this phrase is a proof. 
Well, obviously, this is a significant evidence, and the fact that Georgia was admitted to the Council of Europe earlier than the neighbors, it is also the evidence of these European credentials, a desire of a significant portion of the population to be part of Europe. But you know, another fact, 75%, the latest polls of National Democratic Institute of US, 75% want Georgia to be part of EU, and 45% of Georgians resent the, uh, the, the, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, 40 to 45%. 45% of Georgians believe that the end of the Soviet Union was bad because of economy. So it means that if you add 75% to 45, you gain, I also have the technical backgrounds, you'll find 120, so at least 20% of Georgian population, probably a quarter, probably up to a quarter, a fifth to a quarter of Georgians, they want European Union and they lament the death of the Soviet Union at the same time, so one person. Well, it seems irreconcilable how a person can want, want European Union and again and, and regret about the Soviet Union being no longer around. Well, because that's how that people understand Europe. So for them, Europe is not work ethics. It's not about pluralism. It's not about human rights. It's about being feeling protected. It's probably about social security. It's probably about well, good pensions, it's probably about actually like some goodies that the state gives you. So that's, I believe, kind of this where people are probably, okay, kind of this like, not only this 45%, but in 45, including those who seemingly on the surface want Georgia to become part of the European Union, because they see in European Union what they lost in the Soviet Union, maybe. At least 20, at most 25% of Georgians actually are on this mind. So therefore, yes, that a uh, phenomenon, that type of thinking, this, okay, this psychological, I would say, kind of like uh, arrangement of a person, of a personality, does exist. And uh, of course, it is significantly lower in countries like Georgia than in modern in Russia or in some Central Asian state. But again, okay, a lot needs to be done. And again, I am not actually even, even uh, mentioning this political situation of Georgia, how over 30 years the states of every successive leadership wanted to rule by themselves alone without distributing power. Again, for me it is also actually kind of the legacy of the Soviet authority. They do not have the political culture of distributing power, of ruling alongside someone else. They, the winner take it all approach. Well, okay, which may be good for the Abba song, but hardly good for the political, for the, I would say, developed political entity. Okay, thank you for your attention. Looking forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I bet there are a number of questions. Yes. Um, I was wondering whether you could explain the concept of Homo Soviticus a little more. The concept? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <coughs> So, um, generally, it is the subtype of a personality which became very obedient to the authorities, which accept the rules that the authorities establish. Okay, uh, the state is run the way it is run, and the people are passive recipients of these rules, even if they don't like the rules. So, they try to adjust to the rules. They are passive, they uh, do not protest, because they fear, because the state is authoritarian or totalitarian, will punish them. They cannot organize, because despite them participating in common, I would say, in, in the group work, they are atomized, and this agency of uh, human agency is weak, and political participation is also weak, because people do not trust each other. Because uh, they can only, they trust only kind of their family members, very close friends, with whom they might say kind of during in the kitchen, during the tea time, how they dislike certain things in the country, but they'll never share it to an outsider because the trust is very low, very low social capital in the society, and people are relatively atomized. And again, and also, uh, as I told you, weak work ethic, because what I told you, it is characteristic, it is typical for pretty much every authoritarian, even maybe milder authoritarian society. But in Soviet Union, it was also uh, pretty low work ethics. So therefore, well, in some societies, people actually kind of, they find the, uh, the outlet. So they, um, they at least actually kind of devote themselves to work, 
to their job, like to their family, so that they don't think about political participation, knowing that it is futile. Well, in Soviet Union, kind of that part is also largely missing. Even though, even though uh, on, the, on the level of like pronouncements, like, like I would say political enunciations are very lavish, in this, very lavish in the Soviet Union. So they were saying that we are creating the new type of a person, selfless, like excellence oriented, uh, okay, uh, socially minded, but neither was the case. Um, I was wondering uh, if you can tell us about uh, Khrushchev gas. Like, do what? you think Khrushchev, Khrushchev gas? Do you think that participating in terms of like putting people in boxes uh, mentally as well, just by <laughs> architecture? Do, if you if you have okay. thought about it, you know, architecture and cars and you know some items. You know, kind of like, like non-military, kind of daily items, they're also actually characteristic of the state. Well, I, I also saw buildings similar to Khrushchevka on the outskirts of London. Maybe kind of they were better built, they looked nicer, but you know, this like the uh, ceilings were like pretty low and you know, they were like a part of below. So in many industrial cities, for instance, in Birmingham, okay, outside the center you see kind of where, okay, they are nicer than Khrushchevka because they're not actually kind of just like, well, a rectangle slab, right. Much. Yes, uh, uh, and you know, but you know, and, you know, in many countries you can tell this city because like not all being so like in the Soviet Union outside the center, so cities were indistinguishable. Well, uh, the outskirts of Tbilisi look just the outskirts of, uh, I don't know, Minsk or Tashkent or any, um, any other city. Of course, the conformity was also in that um, in the building, in the buildings and in the, in the living space. Although uh, sometimes they were allowed, for instance, actually kind of like when Georgian builders were building a, a home in say in Uzbekistan or Tur Turkmenistan, they could write some like, make some Georgian ornament on one of the walls like to show that is the contribution of Georgia. If you go to the Ahmeteli metro station, you will see several actually decorated buildings. One is like in Uzbek style, another is Turkmen style, so several, but it's all, it was symbolic. But it was right to the metro station, it was right to the underground station so that the people, maybe potential tourists can see it, but the second layer of the building, kind of the second, I would say tier is already, is already faceless, faceless or actually kind of rectangular solids. And yeah, unfortunately the cars as well. Well, uh, you know, Soviet products other than related to military industrial complex, yes, Russian, uh, Soviet, sorry, that's a mistake. I always, again, and again, so it's like uh, take it by way of warning. When you refer to the period before 1991, this part of the world, say Soviet, not Russian. This is correct. Russian is incorrect. It's the same as, well, some of you may be in Scotland, if you refer to United Kingdom as England, obviously you won't like it, like very appealing. You find it very appealing. Similar thing about like um, equating uh, Russia to the Soviet Union. So, uh, sorry, what was the question? Was? So, uh, low, low cost, obviously, in the, the past, uh, is, is it okay? Or? Well, so, so, okay, I'll, I'll uh, okay, say yeah, more ahead. about it, uh, the question. So, obviously, the factor of building Khrushchev gas was the uh, uh, speed of the mm -hmm. building and the low cost of the building because it was kind of like a Legos. But still, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering because it was, when you go into this Khrushchev you feel like you are same. Like every single <laughs> home you go in, it's like same. So you wouldn't even think I feel like. You see, it, it, it was easy to get lost. You, it was in the, in the email, yeah. Even, there is in even a movie about it. Yes, there is a movie, exactly. I was uh, you just like, like take it, took it from my talk. There was a very famous Soviet comedy, romantic comedy about that, about, about building in Moscow and then Leningrad being so similar, having the same address, so the person actually by mistake like goes well. He gets drunk and goes to another city, city and then the whole story starts. Well, probably kind of some of you maybe saw this film. Yeah, so I, I was just... Uh uh, saying that e even though it was like a fast and obviously um, cost-effective, uh, do you think that they had in mind that to to uh, morph people into these squares mentally while you're living in it? Like obviously you're living in it every single day. You go in and your neighbor has the same. So you kind of create, a, like you don't get jealous. 
Yeah, first. uniformity. Yes, yes. uniformity. Yeah, and, and and the school's uniforms actually serve the same uh, thing that you don't show off uh, your wealth. You are all kind of kind of the same. Yes, this uniformity did exist, and you know, interestingly, many. Um, some Eastern European countries, like East Germany and like Romania, they had their own tricks about actually kind of just like reaching uniformity. In some, it was uh, kindergarten clothes or the way they actually they were, were organized, kind of like, like arranged before kind of the classes. Uh, so in Romania, it was another one. In Romania, kind of like they removed, they removed from the outskirts of the building many historical sites like all to the center. So the historic outskirts of the building could only be filled by these actually kind of like these rectangular slabs. Well, they, you know, and they, they, it was really, really kind of like difficult like to move the building kind of, well, it's, it's, it's a whole procedure. So they, uh, in, in, in Bucharest they showed me kind of this like when one church, by the way, it's a church called Ant in Iveriano, kind of this founded by a Georgian priest. So they moved it by three or four kilometers. So in order actually kind of to, to have the space like for buildings, for uh, apartment buildings. Yeah, yeah, obviously, obviously. Oh, by the way, in, in, well, in Berlin is a wonderful city. I was there about a month ago. And you can, even without looking in the map, you can tell whether you are in Western Berlin or like Soviet, like East Berlin, even without looking at other landmarks. So you can like, you can like look at the building and say that like the more faceless building, more uniform building, actually like less individuality usually means that you're in the socialist part of the city. So uh, my question is the following. Uh, the title of our lecture was, if there are still homo serviticus around us in Georgia, okay? Uh, and why? if that 45% of Georgians who are still nostalgic about Soviet Union, why they are nostalgic. Uh, we know well that uh, when Brexit started in Britain, Brexiteers, the leaders of this movement, and they actually, they won, okay? they left the European Union. Uh, leaders of the Brexit, they would directly call the European Union, the Soviet Union, without Gulag. So they didn't see any difference mm -hmm. between the Soviet Union, they don't see still Nigel Farage, for example, mm -hmm. between the Soviet Union and the European Union. The only exception is that the Soviet had Gulag, you know, all these stupid, crazy things. Nothing else is different between these two institutions, as they say. So. Uh, what do you think? Why Georgians, that 45%, may be still nostalgic? Mm -hmm. Because are Georgians, by their nature, social democrats, like true Europeans? And that's why they don't like capitalism, let's say so. <laughs> uh, okay. That's my question. Okay, so I would just like mention, like good before I like, uh, start um, answering directly the question. Uh, Georgians might have special relation with social democracy. Again, I mentioned this Democratic Republic of Georgia, 1918, 1921. One of the best scholars of Georgia proper is called Stephen Jones. He's originally British. He lives in UK in Mount Holyoke College, and he wrote several wonderful books about um, 19, uh, late 19th, early 20th century Georgia. One of the books is like Socialism in Georgian Colors. So, and why it was, there were so many Georgians in that first like movements within the Russian Empire because when, when Georgian Democratic Republic was established most of these Georgians were like social democrats of this okay, Russian, Russian Empire social democratic party. So there is something, there is something. There was a, there was, there was a Gurian Republic, another integral ah. phenomenon actually in Georgia like in, uh, in early uh, 20th century which shows that it's, uh, it's, I wouldn't say it's like social democratic, it's narrowly political. It's about community spirit, it's about actually kind of like social trust and social capital, which Georgians naturally have more. But again, I believe Russian Empire and Soviet Union and several rounds of purges, and uh, which, which saw many bright Georgians actually kind of like uh, being killed or uh, thrown out of the country. So it reduced that level very significantly, and now it's it's up to us, Georgians, actually, to restore it. So, well, it's, no, it's not going to be easy. It will take time so that we don't have this 45%. And also, this 45%, of course, it's, like, it's, like, uh, it's related to demography. Most of these people are people above 50. 
So yes, but when you, uh, the, the, the age break down, most of it, but also kind of they say younger people as well, like who hear stories and who are dissatisfied with the current actually kind of like state of affairs. So I think like main reason uh, is that Georgia still lives worse than in 1989. They hear the stories and again, I also, you can have a right message, you can say a right thing, but say it actually in a very like aggressive way so that the people don't accept it. Well, for instance, why I, again, I was in Berlin about a month ago, I visited a wonderful place, Deutsche Demokratische Republik, DDR Museum, museum like German Democratic Republic Museum, museum of that like Eastern Germany. So, you know, uh, there was nothing as aggressive as we see that the Museum of Soviet Occupation. Even though, yes, Deutsche Demokratische Republik, of course it was a Soviet occupation. You can see this like, I would say, harsher, I would say, elements, harsher episodes of this uh, Eastern German history in this Checkpoint Charlie, another very iconic place in Berlin, kind of the checkpoint when the Western, Eastern Soviet, like I would say, communist Berliners could go to, um, to West Berlin. Of course, kind of this, the exchange was very limited, but that was another important place. Uh, they put these harsher episodes of history uh, in the Checkpoint Charlie, while in the museum they both show mostly daily life. And they show, you can understand why, by the end of the, if you like see all this, um, if you go, go through the museum, it's not a very big one, but you know it's very rich, it's like very kind of like dense. Uh, by the end of the tour you would understand why people believed in the cause. So it was the combination of carrot and stick, fear and benefits. And you know, they're made to believe that their society, it might be not as rich generally as West Germany, but we have social equality, uh, we have opportunities for everyone, we have decent standards of living, you can like pursue our goals, uh, you can have different like professions, the state is, uh, does help us, and well, we don't have to like stay in the like, uh, wait for the car, for the like, ter probably the worst car ever invented, Trabant, like East German car. So, uh, you, you had to stay um, in a wait for the car for three, four years, not ten years, like, uh, like it was the case in the Soviet Union. So, it was a number of benefits. And you would understand that what, again, when you say about Homo Sovieticus, it's like another actually subtype, like in Eastern Germany. So, they created obedient citizens. It was a museum, I would call it a museum of mental occupation, which is far more lasting than physical occupation. But physical occupation, you can suppress the revolt, but people still have kind of this like actually kind of this like this spirit. Uh, they will be resenting. They will actually find resources, they will wait, they will mobilize and they actually uh, question authorities again. But there is no revolt in Georgia after 1924. It only appeared once in a generation, 1924, then 1956, then 1978. There were some episodes when people were protesting in Georgia. Again, it happened in 20, once in 20, 30 years, but for Soviet Union even that was challenging. It was, that was a cause for concern. So, and after that, they usually, they were like increasing aid towards Georgia, so that actually kind of just like, well, try to appease them even more. So after that, this like, uh, this critical event. So again, it's about mental okay, occupation. So mentally, we're still not that free. And again, an economy, of course, actually does a significant part of the job, because economically, when we do not see clearly the full benefits of being pro-Western country, uh, benefits from who benefit from the visitor? Mostly kind of younger people. Some of them find opportunities. Of course, they cannot stay there, but they, kind of, they find they establish some connections, and they, and then in, a, in a year they leave the country. So, before, still a lot to be done. Thank you for your lecture. Um, you. I have a question about current Homo Sabaticus and the previous one, previous generation because it feels um, like there is a difference, and the main difference is ideological. Uh, the Soviet state uh, has this idea, uh, like post-national idea of uh, friendship of all nations, which is a great romantic idea. And uh, for the last 30 years, years I uh, see how the government tried to find the new idea for, for Russia. Russia. Yes, I'm from Russia, and I lived there for mm. 35 years. So um, I have a little experience there. Um, but they um, didn't manage to find anything better than the idea of uh, um, winning the World War mm -hmm. II. And this, for me, seems like a big difference. Because uh, one idea is like post-national and like a friendship, and another idea is a country as a winner. And what role 
um, ideology um, um, embed in this uh, term of uh, uh, Homo Sovieticus and mm -hmm. is there any difference between these two generations of Homo Sovieticus? Well, again, so I have been in Russia last time three years ago for only three days. Um, so in like seventies. Before that, I was in nineteen ninety eight. Therefore, I do not have actually kind of like that a uh, hands on experience, hands on actually contacts with this uh, with the majority of Russians, with the Russians who living in Russia. Of course, they understand that like those view who are here are not a representative sample of like Russians today. And that's one of the reasons you are here, like not in Russia, obviously. So um, I would actually kind of my guess would be that obviously kind of. Uh, they are different generations, they are different people. They are not like uh, these this Soviet people who were either war veterans or the direct sons or daughters of the war veterans. Those are not the people who see, uh, I won't say almost daily, but almost every year that something was successful in the Soviet Union. Uh, being actually kind of like uh, winning the hockey cup or something else, or uh, in terms of sending a man in space in terms of like sending men in open space, okay, Gagarin, Leonov, uh, Sputnik, okay, there have been some serious achievements in the Soviet Union. They didn't have to like, like only look in the, in the past. So for Putin, today's Russia is much weaker than the Soviet Union in terms of like resources. I would, I would say that Russia managed, contemporary Russia really managed to be head and shoulders above their Soviet predecessors in terms of corruption, in terms of intensity, they are stealing resources like from their own people, they are robbing their own people. Soviet authorities were actually kind of like amateurs and children compared to them. So they are like, like, like kindergarten children compared to the, the, the current leaders in that particular regard. So um, they, there are no resources, they, like Russia is destined to become, uh, to be uh, medium middling country, like a regional country. Uh, so that's why they can, um, and, and you know, these victories will not come by easily as it was the case in the Soviet Union because Russia is much weaker and much more corrupt than even, even Soviet Union was, even like Soviet, Soviet Russian, uh, Russian Federation was. So therefore, um, the only way is actually to look at the past. That's why the people are different. So they only live in the past. So they don't live in the future. That's why in order to give them something tangible, so, so put in anything, nothing more, but to re-establish the Soviet Union. That's why Shoigu says, the, uh, what he says, that's why the uh, Soviet hockey players put Soviet, the Russian hockey players put Soviet jerseys. So again, so kind of they associate the greatest with the Soviet Union. Again, and obviously it's not tenable. It's not a livable formula. It's, 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 it's well, it's like a um, stillborn project, unfortunately. Well, but it works for a time. So uh, again, the only thing, okay, uh, it might sound actually a little bit like a little bit dramatic and not a good piece of advice, but if Russian leadership becomes more efficient, but the problem and the issue is, but unfortunately they cannot become more efficient because they cannot admit any uh, political competition because political competition will means financial competition. They might lose power in a few years time. So they are not taking any chances. They keep things as they are, but this is of course, detrimental to the Russian interests. This is um, weakening Russia internally. Uh, this ensures that m brightest people and like more actually critical people are leaving the country. So, uh, and, and therefore actually it's a, it's, 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 it's a recipe, it's a recipe for decline and okay, I would say that it, would, it would be the recipe for a slow decline but on February 24th, Russian leadership committed harakiri, basically like well, the term. So luckily, it will be not so bloody like like, like generally, and will uh, okay, will have I wouldn't say not peaceful. It cannot be like have a peaceful end, but you know it's like not so dramatic and tragic. End. Too many questions. So, uh, one more is it's not more of a question. It, it's uh, just if you can elaborate more on uh, that Soviet Union was standing on actually eliminating the religion and uh, mm -hmm. Putin is doing also. Religion? Yeah. Okay, he's, he's obviously using mm -hmm. religion yes. for his advantage. And I, I think that's mm -hmm. one part that he actually got it right in terms of mani like managing large amounts of people, but it's so, so uh -huh. really wrong in terms of that, I, in my opinion. But please, uh, if you can... Yeah, religion is an important factor. Yeah, for one, Russia is not an uh, atheist state like Soviet uh, Union was, and religion, and again, it's like, uh, like 
special department. It's like, okay, it's like it was a very important factor in uh, keeping social fabric as it was. Uh, for instance, one of the sources of resentment of Georgians was kind of they, they couldn't exercise religion, and many people expressed their anti-Soviet sentiment. They couldn't express it ex exact, or, I mean, uh, okay, directly, but they did it by wearing the cross and just like showing that therefore they are not loyal. So uh, <coughs> in today's Russia, you know, uh, and again, it is not a, um, it is not a very stable cocktail, I would say. So today's Russia, Russian uh, patriarchy is like it's like extension of the state. So there is, no, there is no independence, there is no actually kind of like separation. So today it's, it's, like, it's like a department in the Ministry of Culture. Probably kind of the patriarch receives the, 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 the salary of the like, like deputy minister because according to because what he does, he does a state job. Yeah, he does a state job. So therefore he also weaponized like religion in order to present Russia as a um, state which is based on spiritual values like duhovnes, duhovnes krepe, kind of spiritual bonds that uh, will keep us together as opposed to the western materialistic like mundane only oriented on actually kind of like profit oriented actually decadent west so and unfortunately some derogatory word like gay europa so we want europe europe actually kind of you will be all actually do we have like we want the gay parades and you know what is interesting this is this policy of russia is designed not for russians because generally russians are not religious russians are not like georgians and armenians <laughs> russian society is not religion and a few days ago uh what is his name by this a singer which was openly gay uh, died at the age of like like 68 or like 69. And there was another couple of other singers. Like one is gay, another is well uh, unclear because sometimes he's dressed up like Philip Kirkorov. I mean, like, like dressed up like like uh, a very strange. So, in Russian society, kind of there is no, I would say, mm, base. It is not a fertile ground. What Russia is doing and kind of they like the way they plays with religion. It is designed for us, for Georgians, Armenians, Azerbaijani, like uh, some particularly southern republics, to keep them. Uh, to keep them actually kind of like culturally close because I know personally, just imagine, a Georgian citizen, I know uh, okay, a friend of mine, a, a colleague who gay people, person with higher education who used to like teach in the university, um, himself an IDP in 1993 uh, when uh, Russia supported like Abkhaz uh, separatists, he was like driven out of the, um, uh, he's from, uh, from a Chamchir. And now he's saying, I do understand how bad is Russia, obviously. I, I know kind of they, okay, they killed like my relative. They ensured that actually kind of they, they turned me into IDP in my own country. Of course, Russia, I hate Russia politically, but culturally I feel some affinity to Russians because, okay, Russia occupied 20% of our territory, but if we have this gay parade here. So it means entire Georgia is lost. It means 100% of Georgia is occupied. That's why. So in Europe, he's, it, he sees decadence, less of moral fortitude. And in Russia, he sees like spirituality, religion. And since he is himself religious, this orthodoxy, the common religion of Georgia and Russia, it's a, well, it's, it's being used by Russia as a glue, as an attempted glue, like to um, stick like Georgian society and Georgian like people like to, to Russia because of this cultural affinity and common religion. It works for that person. I know a couple of other people. Uh, well, and probably it is a, I wouldn't say significant, but a, I would say sizable fraction of the society. And that's what Russia uses actually. It's, it uses actually kind of its patriarchy like mostly for the other republics. For, for the republics which are still undecided. We are, I think we are also actually kind of undecided. We might think today that 75% what EU integration, 70% wants NATO integration, but here we have also 45% of people who, uh, well, believe the Soviet Union, it will be better off with the Soviet Union still on. I was wondering how, how it comes that uh, priests are educated in Russia. As you said, the Russian patriarchy is very dominant here. And no, no, it's not dominant. Well, they try to be influential. Uh, they try. They just yeah. try? They try. Well, they're not that successful, but they have been trying and they keep trying. Okay. I wouldn't say they're dominant. So again, so they do have certain influence. Uh, I would say mm, many Georgians, because of their relatively relig religious kind of, they fall under that influence. But uh, again, I wouldn't actually risk saying what, what is the percentage, but probably I would wager, I would wager to say 10 to 20%. Mm -hmm. It's still minority. Okay, so. Well, then I don't need to ask my question. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, so it was uh, on the assumption that most of people are under the sway of Russian patriarch or Russian patriarchy. Under the assumption that church leadership is educated in Russia. 
church leadership, okay, they have this specialized education. Uh, well, the patriarch himself, well, he is patriarch in name only. He is a, he is the, he is the, uh, he is the kind of KGB slash FSB. He is the security service like guy. Okay, he's an officer, well, who puts on kind of these clothes and therefore serves the interests of the state. Well, he has the specialized education, he himself. Uh, but the majority of the like priests and like the clergymen, like, well, I wouldn't say kind of they're particular, not the sharpest knives <laughs> in the drawers mostly. Some are, but you know, on some of them, some became like, uh, like symbols uh, and the speakers of like, like the Russian state. For those, they are most eloquent, they have good vocabulary, they speak well, they uh, can bring about some historical examples, or so they are elaborate. Right? They are, okay, their IQ is fine, including the patriarch. But the majority of the Russian church, obviously kind of they are also, um, okay, kind of their education leaves a lot to be desired. They, um, um, in the Soviet time, there was state-controlled spiritual seminary, once in kind of like in the uh, next to Moscow, a couple of others in other um, in other towns. Okay, they were getting like narrow specialized education. Now, to the best of my knowledge, again, I'm not like a specialist in this regard, but you know what I hear from the Russians now, this like the level of education is really declining, and you, we can have priests who might not know some elementary things and who are not actually curious about the world, who just like just repeat kind of these like verses, okay, whatever it is like from, uh, who, or who call the Bible. They are like the majority, but some of them, several of them are really kind of articulate and they, well, they try to influence Russian population, kind of they tell their people, they explain why it was a right to invade Ukraine. So they go as far as saying it was right to invade Ukraine and they explain that very soon it will be George's turn because of we, our like common uh, orthodox space, it should be reunited. And you know, they say it, they say it articulate. Of course they lie, of course it's demagogy, but this is a demagogy that part of Russian society buys. Thank you. So. I think if there are no more questions, I, I probably will make a little comment. And if you'd like, you can comment on a comment. <laughs> well, I'm, <laughs> I'm good, I think. Uh, yeah, it was really kind of like nice uh, range of questions, like from, from different yeah. perspectives, which, probably and again, which allowed me to tell something which I either forgot or like actually kind of didn't foresee, like didn't that's plan. That's why I wanted also to bring something that fueled this online discussion at some point, if you remember. <laughs> this, I think we didn't have enough of time, uh -huh. probably we had a, like a really wide range of topics, mm -hmm. which was very interesting uh, to touch upon. Uh, I'm sorry, yes, because yeah, this topic was really so broad, so that my talk was destined to be incomplete and narrow, because it's so multidimensional. Obviously, I cannot, exactly, Vas, I couldn't like, touch upon like most of aspects, but you know, I managed like to touch whatever I, I found to be like the uh, most topical at the moment. Wow. Right. We are yeah. all over My, for yeah. example, so it's, it's a very, momentous issue for Georgians. You know. I was born in Soviet times, so to some extent I'm from Soviet you know. <laughs> Right. All the while I'm Harvard fellow, but still, you know, it hurts. It's <laughs> like, it, it was such a good input because it's directly connected to my comment that I, I yeah, wanted to, to yeah. make very briefly that do you think, or do we all think that it's, it might be helpful to label, to use this labeling system or signal system as some sociologists call it, calling somebody uh, homo sovieticus, not uh, on academic papers, kind of, but during debates or during personal, discussions. Well. Yeah, as a personal labeling, would it be really helpful? Not necessarily homo sovieticus, nobody would address anybody like this, but given these hints of being a little bit like living old in the school, past, right, or like old like school <laughs> or narrow-minded <laughs> or not embracing new mm -hmm. opportunities. Or living in the 20th century rather than... Right. Like, as we, I think we all can hear this kind of brave generalizations from time to time when people debating somewhere just sitting with friends or on the television. 
so what would be helpful actually for the discussion? Not meaning to separate somebody and to divide somebody into like Homo Sovieticus and like Post Sovieticus mm. or Homo Economicus, as some, some yes, people yeah, yeah. say. Because, these because days. it's like more general. By the way, I probably Homo Economicus was coined after Homo Sovieticus as actually kind of like underlying the economic, I would say, desires of people and well, the, the desire to live better and. Yes, yeah. <laughs> 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 now, I, I mean, I all for accepting human fluidity in general, but in in some in some discussions that really request much more um, elaborated and critical yeah, approach. Yeah, it has to be subtle. Yes, generally. Yeah. But what 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 would you? What, what kind of narrative or approach would you offer to your students, for example, to step away from being uh, like harshly uh -huh. neoliberal, anti-Soviet, anti-Homo Sovieticus, erasing all the kind of past uh -huh. uh, mindset? Because mentality is also a questionable term, I think. Soviet mentality, you know, people say uh -huh. it a lot. But maybe mindset patterns, what would you offer to younger generation, for example, who would discuss okay. this concept? And again, no, uh, generally, frankly speaking, I don't find that term particularly offensive. Of course, it's like it has a distinct negative it's, it's connotation. It's not offensive, it's triggering people Trigger, yeah, because it's too broad. Yes, of course. It's, and again, it was coined by a person, by Alexander Zinov, the, uh, the, the writer, who who wrote it, uh, this book in 1981, three years after he was, he was expelled from the Soviet Union. Obviously, kind of, he was extremely resentful and he was laying it too thick and of course he was, uh, he was very partial, obviously. He was uh, like exaggerating and obviously this term, which was obviously very like, like condescending, like derogatory, was probably his response to the Soviet authorities. And obviously he had a general dislike to the entirety of the Soviet Union, probably many citizens of the Soviet Union, because, well, mm, again, almost no one protested. Well, when he was expelled from the Soviet Union, there was no mass rally about actually in defense. Only only few uh, kind of just his fellow writers actually kind of just like express opinion that maybe yes, he, he made a big mistake, but maybe it's too harsh to expel him from the Soviet Union. And again, that was his personal. That's why actually this term was coined in the first place. Uh, later it was used like uh, okay, it, it 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 caught on because it's like well, it's like well, uh, a pretty articulate term for all these negative so connotations. So it's up to Georgians now, if you, okay. if you try to restore it, you can do it. Right? <laughs> okay. So it's okay. past. Okay. It's okay. Never, yeah, it's never uh, 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 it is so past. So is a bad <laughs> phenomenon. Well, uh, here I wouldn't agree. See the Russian hockey players yeah. putting, on, uh, Russian, putting on Soviet jerseys. See Shoigu saying that it will be restored. So it's maybe... Well, it's dead politically, but in the mindset of many people, they, well, they didn't create anything new. Well, that was a question about this, more contemporary Russia, like, like no distinct ideology. They didn't create, they didn't manage to create anything new. That's why, actually. Putin would be rating Stalin and Lenin, even Putin. Well. Because, yeah, because he knows that. Yeah, he needed it. He needed it. He needed it for, uh, to, to create, um, to explain his invasion of Ukraine, right? To, 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 he needed it for a rationale. That's why, actually, kind of. And again, he, he is not himself actually already kind of like Soviet citizens. He is not okay like a Soviet type. He is pretty flexible. He could well. I heard Putin the liberal in 2001, 2002, when he was asked whether uh, whether he um, would contemplate Russia joining NATO. He answered, "Why not?" Even in English, actually, during the interview. Yeah. So, and and again, well, he could be different. Obviously, what he does not because well, he he knows of all people. He served as a um, KGB officer in Germany in the German embassy in the, in the Soviet embassy in Berlin. So he knows full well the deficiencies of the Soviet Union. And he knows how vulnerable his position was when Germany was reunited. He knew all these defects of the Soviet Union. He, obviously, he he doesn't believe in these merits of that uh, cause. He needs it for. Uh, for political influence. He needed to prolong his uh, political life. That's, that's his only rationale. That's his only, I would say, kind of like deity. Yeah. So he's only concerned about like his political future 
And again, not distributing, not, uh, not sharing this, this political future with someone else. He wants to be the president for life. And for that, he needs obedient population. And he found no other rationale to bring back Soviet Union and live in the past. So, yep. yeah, I think we need to wrap up for tonight. But what probably we can all or most of us uh, agree on to uh, would be, I think, as long as like so-called post-Soviet, Soviet, Homo Sovieticus mindset um, narratives are alive and are being used, they should be approached critically, mm -hmm. right? Not, yeah, with understanding that it is like, again, as a political expediency that, <coughs> so, that today actually people actually kind of recall the Soviet Union. Obviously, it's formally, it's a part of the past already. Right, so yeah. Hopefully, that critical critical mindset, not post-Soviet or Soviet <laughs> or in the middle uh, mindset, would would serve us at some point. But let's try to be critically set and uh, keep donating to help and to leave. Please would be much appreciated. Mm -hmm. And our colleague Anna would uh, help you <laughs> to find the donation box. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much once again. Thank you for inviting me. It was a really kind of interesting opportunity to share my thoughts about like idea which about which I have been thinking uh, thinking a lot. Yeah. So it was actually like nice opportunity uh, to put it all together. Also, like a, a bunch of materials was were provided uh, by the professor. So I would gladly share them, and uh, probably it would be very helpful to really deconstruct and to dive mm -hmm. into what was mentioned tonight. Uh, so next Friday we are meeting here again and the speaker would be Georgi Arziani from the Tbilisi School for Social Research or Library about Georgia and an NGO, a young but thriving NGO that um, tries to establish a conversation and to be a mediator between the government and civil society in Georgia, including both uh, IDPs who are very socially active, um, uh, immigrants, experts, uh, basically all the engage politically engaged citizens of, of Georgia and uh, covering a broad range of topics from Abkhazia and uh, the Tsikhina Valley region, South Ossetia, Samachablo, whatever term you use. Uh, to deconstructing Soviet heritage through the architecture, for example. Mm. So he would yeah. talk about being an NGO and dealing with uh, state policies on the communal and social level. So I think it's very, it's very interesting and uh, challenging approach, but probably the most hopeful one for the civil society. So please uh, stay tuned and um, come back to us. Thank you. Thank you.